Good morning. Welcome to the National School Safety Virtual Conference. My name is Gary Sigris, and I am today's moderator and will be helping facilitate today's meetings. Um, I want to welcome you to our virtual conference. Um, it probably, uh, if we look for a silver lining in this pandemic, uh, it's reminding us that those who are in charge of safety and security for your school district or college, that um, we need to be following an all hazards approach. It, it's more important that we focus on the things that are more likely to occur versus the things that um, um, we, we tend to focus on too much. You know, we, we tend to focus more on the active shooter uh, when we're more likely to have a child um, lose a student because of a car crash over the weekend. So um, I, the downside about us not meeting face to face is that um, one of the things I like most about attending uh, safety conferences is meeting the person sitting beside me who has faced similar challenges that I've faced in my schools and to be able to hear how they solve their issues. And that's really what we're gonna miss the most about this conference is we're gonna miss that collaborative piece. Uh, that being said, um, we're doing the best we can in the today's pandemic. Uh, we've discussed the possibility of being able to go face to face next year. And based on things that we're hearing, uh, next year may not work either. It may be February uh, 2022 before we can actually get back together again and meet face to face. Uh, we will be asking your opinions about those kind of things because those of you who are working for schools or universities, um, you know, what's what's your view of how people are going to be spending money and for professional development? Is, is that going to be a priority once things get back to what we call normal? Um, not really sure. We don't want to hold a conference where people aren't allowed to attend because budgets aren't there. Uh, school safety is always going to be in the forefront. Um, I, I can remember back in 2008, my first conference uh, with the United States Department of Education, and we were all worried about uh, the avian flu, the bird flu. And then those of you that were in this business back in 2009, we had uh, H1N1 2009, the year of the swine. And we had to pivot very quickly from one um, hazard to another. And that really is, is what's happening in our schools today. Um, we get a lot of calls from people asking about safety drills, et cetera. And one of the nice things about safety drills is that now we focus um, more on safety than speed. And, and that's really kind of a, an important thing. Those of you who um, were working in the field after Parkland, you know, we, we all reevaluated how we were going to do our um, our fire drills because of what happened during that event. So, you know, we're constantly looking to see how we can keep our students safe. 
um, and protected even during a pandemic. So hopefully you are getting a lot of help from your local law enforcement, your local um, EMA, your local uh, health department. This is definitely proving to us once again that school safety is a collaborative effort. It means we work with people from our community or stakeholders. Uh, we listen to what's happening on the federal level, and then we make decisions that are right for our school. And in this pandemic, we are seeing some schools that are still virtual. We see some schools that are doing a hybrid, and we see some schools that are shutting back down, not necessarily because of outbreaks that are happening in their school, but because they don't have enough uh, substitute teachers and bus drivers when people have to quarantine. So this is presenting a lot of unique challenges, which will continue until well into next year. And we have to do the best that we can, and that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do the best we can under these circumstances. So uh, we, have, we have four days uh, packed full of conferences. Uh, we have some of the best and brightest speakers from across the United States. And um, there will be questions and answer periods. There will be times when um, uh, we'll, we'll answer every question that we can. There will be uh, door prizes at the end that you'll fill out the survey to become eligible for. And we'll talk about that more later on. But really, this is your time to ask questions. And um, if we don't get to your questions, uh, I promise you, we will get you the answers that you are looking for. Um, every one of the speakers that we'll have over the next four days, will their contact information will be uh, in their presentation. You have access to all the presentations, all the materials that you can download ahead of time. So if you're the kind of person that likes to take notes, you can do that. Um, unfortunately, there will not be coffee breaks or lunches, uh, which uh, the, the National School Response uh, Conference are famous for. Um, we have some of the best breakfasts and lunch of any conference there is. Um, Ron, I am not going to continue talking just to fill up time. If you are ready, let me know and we can start um, the introduction so that you may have the ability to um, have as much time as you need. So uh, Ron's going to talk to us today about the relationship um, with principals, school resource officers, and school security officers, and how they can work effectively together. Now, I'm going to let Ron tell you about himself, but I'm going to tell you one of the things that impresses me most. Ron has that unique ability to speak two languages. He has a law enforcement background which means he can speak law enforcement, and he's worked in schools, which means he can talk education. And, and those are two different languages, believe it or not, and sometimes it causes conflict. So what Ron's going to tell us today is how do we resolve that conflict so that everyone works together. So Ron, I'm going to let you take it away. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me as a keynote speaker to your conference. Uh, Prepared Schools was developed uh, because uh, principals, administrators, superintendents don't receive the kind of training uh, in their school programs that need to prepare them for things that happen on their campuses. And by things, I mean um, critical events, uh, how to respond to situations, how to prevent situations. And so the training was developed uh, in modules um, that helped to train school security officers and school resource officers and principals uh, how to respond to situations. And so today's uh, presentation is going to focus on how they can all work together uh, to get this done. Uh, so let's begin. Your school day starts out like most others. Phone call to parents, staff meetings, budget meetings, etc. Then during lunchtime, a student runs into your office crying uncontrollably and tell you, tells you she was raped in the theater. Or it's early morning and your staff are just arriving to work. When the business education teacher comes into your office 
and tells you someone has broken into the computer lab and stolen several laptops. Or a student contacts you in the hallway during class and tells you a boy is lying face down in a pool of blood in the restroom and there is a knife on the floor beside him. Would you know what to do? Would you know what to do? In 1993, let's see here. Got to get the next slide for you. There it is. In 1993, United States Representative Major Owens from the great state of New York introduced legislation H.R. 2455, which later became known as the Safe Schools Act. Many of you are familiar with that and what it did. It was enacted in 1994 and directed the Secretary of Education to make competitive grants to states to ensure that all schools are safe and free of violence. In Washington state, the legislature used part of the grant money to establish training in the area of school safety and security for principals and school security officers. The Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission, which oversees the Law Enforcement Training Academy and the Correctional Officers Academy, was charged with developing training for school security personnel. The Association of Washington School Principals worked closely with the commission to provide training for the state's principals so that the school principals and school security officers would know what to do in these situations. My colleague, Randy Town, who's now retired, was the school safety coordinator for Educational Service District 105 in Yakima, Washington, and I were approached by the state of Washington to develop training materials for the new academy. Today, I have the privilege of sharing some of that information with you. But before we get into today's topic, there, I wanna to talk to you about your role as a leader. Your goal should be to establish a climate of school safety. It begins with you, the principal. Dr. Marcus Jackson tells us the school takes on the personality of their principal. If the principal is mean, the staff will be mean, be mean to one another and the kids, and the kids will be mean to one another. If the principal is full of energy, excitement, and enthusiasm, the teachers will be energized to teach and the students will be excited about learning. The principal can either extinguish a flame of positivity or ignite a flame of hope. The principal is responsible for the culture and mood of their school. And by Wade Stanfield, superintendent of Westward School District, as a leader, your job is to serve, not be served. Your team needs to know you care, serve their heart, your team needs to improve, serve their talent. Your team struggles with doubt, serve their mind and spirit. Your team has potential, save their growth. As a leader, your job is also to establish a climate of respect and trust. Be happy because not everything is good, but because you see good in everything. And Simone Sinek says, we can't be everything to everyone, but we can be something to someone. As a leader, your job is to be purpose driven. Be focused on school safety. Create a climate of trust and respect between staff and students, staff and staff. Encourage people if they see or hear something to say something. Studies have shown that roughly 75% of people knew about an attack 
before it happened. Build relationships, plan and prepare, own your school. Learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow. The important thing is not to stop questioning. What can we do to make our school safer? With that as a background, establishing a climate of school safety, establishing a climate of respect and trust, being the leader you were meant to be, focused on school safety. Let's begin our presentation on how principals, school resource officials, and school security officers can work together to create a safe and healthy learning environment. I remember my first day as principal. I had been an assistant principal for four years and had learned a great deal. But the moment I walked into my office, sat behind my desk as a principal, looked around, I thought to myself, what should I be doing now? And so I looked around the office and I saw the main secretary and I called her in and I said, what are some of the things I should be doing now? And she said, I don't know. It's my first day too. We both had a chuckle. And then I determined from that moment on that it was my job to establish exactly what my role, duty, and responsibilities were and that of everyone under me. And so today we're going to start off, start off by looking at the role, duty, and responsibility of the school security officer and the school uh, resource officer. Having school security is primarily a prevention strategy. The whole concept is one of stopping trouble before it happens in order to maintain a safe and healthy teaching and learning environment for all. School security officers are generally defined as non-commissioned individuals employed by a school district, either as classified or contracted employees to manage safety and security programs on school campuses. School resource officers, by contrast, are defined as commissioned law enforcement officers typically employed by law enforcement agencies and assigned to work with schools as part of an agreement with a local school district. Whether your district employs an SRO or an SSO, the material presented today will help to assist you, the building principal, to know the roles, duties, and responsibilities of your security personnel and assist you in supervising their positions. The material will help you to understand what your role should be in providing for a safe and secure learning environment should you be the one in charge of school security. I know a lot of schools do not have a school security officer or a school resource officer, and so it falls on the principal or assistant principal to assume those roles. School security officer responsibilities. The duties of school security officers are complex and wide reaching. Any among the most important responsibilities are maintaining a visible presence and building trust with students and staff. Another important responsibility includes touring the campus frequently. Make sure your security officer is moving around the campus. High risk areas that have been identified such as locker rooms, bathrooms, isolated hallways and stairways, portable classrooms, playing fields, other outbuildings and isolated areas of the building grounds are potential trouble spots. By varying the route, it creates unpredictability, thus strengthening the security officer's effectiveness. Checking doors and windows for good repair, noting any security breaches on campus, as well as providing security during athletic and other school activities are vital. Officers identify and plan for hazards in the parking lots and other areas of the campus as well. Their job is to be nosy. Being present at a variety of events is another effective deterrent to warding off potential problems. 
Officers should be visible during student lunches, breaks, and passing times between classes. Officers establish contacts with students and enforce school rules. Officers also brief personnel on security related matters. And as a side note, make sure that your secu school security officer is part of your administrative team. It elevates them in the eyes of your staff. A key tool in, is preventative patrol is making recommendations for safety improvements on campus. Verifying that there are no pockets of darkness throughout the building using proper lighting, installing working security cameras. These are the things your school security officer should be looking for and doing. Avoid having a noticeable routine. Find discrete vantage points. Give the impression of omnipresence. Be systematically unsystematic. Those are some of the things you want your school security officer to be doing. Now let's take a look at the roles, duties, and responsibilities of the school resource officer. Those are the law enforcement people that you have contracted with to come into your building. SRO is a fully commissioned sworn law enforcement work with the district and respond to any trouble that may happen. They should be aware of, and you may need to make, make them aware of, school law and policy. Understand the basic concepts of school law. Understand the basic concepts of the school system, the school board, the function of the superintendent, the principals, certified and classified staff, and how they relate to all of that. Their essential duties are to provide, protect lives and property, enforce federal and state and local criminal laws, investigate criminal activity, provide school staff training, provide informational reports to school officials regarding criminal activity, handle calls for service. Uh, looks like my, like my camera went blank. Let's see if we can get that back on for you. You know, there's a dead space here because thank you. Thank you for waiting. All right. So the role of the school security officer is to support you in your role, but not take over your role. There are some additional training needs that I want to uh, make you aware of uh, that you should be providing for your uh, security staff. One things they need to learn to be safe so they can go home at night. Another, oops, is this not working? My slides aren't rotating. Oh. Use of force. Uh, what is the proper use of force? There's a use of force pyramid. If you're not familiar with that, if you look at the left side of the slide, it, it goes from uh, less critical to more critical. And you should be training your people in that. There's a lot of lawsuits around the country because too much use of force has been applied. School law search and seizure, you need to make sure you know the difference between reasonable suspicion and probable cause. Police have to meet the standard of probable cause, whereas you, as a administrator, only needs to reach the reasonable suspicions. Camera going on and off. Okay, crime scene preservation. Some of those scenarios that I talked to you about at the start of this talk, um, you're going to need to know how to protect those crime scenes until the police arrive because some of you, like I had a small district that was about an hour away from any police response, some of you are going to have to 
know how to preserve the scene and collect, uh, maybe collect the evidence. And even if you don't collect the evidence, you'll understand what the police need to do when they arrive on the scene and you can help them. There's a whole training module on that. Interviewing techniques, how to interview uh, witnesses and suspects for that matter. If you're the first one on the scene and you're uh, talking to people, there are certain techniques you should be aware of. And your school security officer should be trained in all of these areas. Report writing, how to write the facts together to create a coherent report so that if you had to go to court or your risk management team, you could do that. Now, with a little bit of background behind us, we're going to look at a few case studies. What I'd like you to do is think about the scene, identify the scene, and then what would you do? So you have the scene picture in your head, and how would you handle it? So situation number one, a female high school sophomore, wheelchair bound, shoots herself in the girl's bathroom adjacent to the main hallway of the school building. Two other girls walk into the bathroom after hearing a loud noise. They discover the girl slumped in her wheelchair. The gun is lying on the floor next to the wheelchair. The two girls run frantically back into the hallway where they coincidentally run into the school nurse. The nurse goes into the bathroom and sees the situation. She feels for a pulse and discovers there is none. The rumor quickly spreads about this being a gang shooting. A half hour after the incident, the media appears at the high school wanting to interview staff and students. All right, get the picture in your head. Identify what the scene is showing you. And then what would you do? How would you handle that? Whether your school security officer handles it or you as an administrator, how would you handle it? Well, the first thing you want to do is secure the scene. Then you want to call 911 and call for a lockdown. You would escort media to the conference room or have someone else do it. Gather the two witnesses and the nurse for statements. All right, situation number two, intruders on campus. The CPV gang has been active during the last six months in burglary, drug running, and allegedly a series of three drive-by shootings in the neighborhood surrounding the school. The targets of the drive-by shootings are rival LVL gang members. Several LVL gang members attend the high school. The principal is given information by the police department that the CPV gangs actively seeking revenge on LVL gang members and will go to any length to achieve their goal. Three days after hearing the information, the principal is informed by the shop instructor that there are two suspicious males roaming hallways of the school. The two males are dressed in blue sweatshirts, blue denim, pants and long black trench coats with blue handkerchiefs wrapped around their left hands. Okay, you got the scene in your head? What would you do? First thing you want to do is take backup with you. You don't want to go into a situation all alone under something like that. Call for a lockdown, call 911. Schools have learned a great deal about school safety over the past 10 years. Unwarranted events still occur no matter how safe we make our schools. The more trained an individual is, the better prepared to handle the situation that can happen on a school campus. Before we leave, I'd like to share with you a story about Coach Bear Bryant. Bear Bryant was the coach for the Alabama, Alabama Crimson Tide for many years, and he held the round record for several years as the college football coach with the most victories. Bear Bryant was an outstanding coach and a tremendous motivator. His players knew they had better play good football. 
The story is told that during one important game, his team was ahead by six points with only a minute left in the game. And they had the ball. It looked as if they had the game sewed up. He sent in a running play to his quarterback, but the quarterback decided to surprise the other team. And Coach Bryant, by calling a pass play, he said, they're looking for the run. Let's throw a pass. So he went back and threw a pass, and sure enough, the defensive cornerback, who was the speed champion of the league, intercepted the ball and headed toward the goal line. Alabama was about to lose the game. The Alabama quarterback, who was known for a good arm but not for fast legs, took off after the cornerback and caught him on the five-yard line. He saved the game. Alabama won. The opposing coach went to Bear Bryant after the game and said, I thought that quarterback was slow. How do you catch my world-class sprinter? Bear Bryant looked at the opposing coach and said, You have to understand. Your man was racing for six points. My man was racing for his life. So when it comes to school safety, run as if your life depended on it, because it may very well. I would like to thank you for having me today as a guest speaker. May God bless you as you serve to protect our nation's children. Thank you. Okay, Ron, thank you very much. Um, I, I want to let the folks know that if you look on the left-hand side of your screen, uh, you are able to um, ask questions. And I think that's pretty important. I, I've got a few here already. Um, and I kind of would also like to hear from those of you who are um, who are working in schools today. Um, you know, Ron talked about SROs. And there are a lot of school districts across the country who are currently um, removing SROs from their schools. Now, part of the reason is um, they're not meeting face to face. So, for example, um, in Columbus, they removed their SROs, not because of any real reason, but schools are not in session. So therefore, they don't need SROs. So my question is, are you seeing that trend across the United States, Ron, with the removal of SROs from schools because of events that have happened in our country this year? Well, that and the defund the police movement and some of the use of force issues are causing quite a few school districts to cancel those contracts, which I think is sad myself. You know, um, I'm, I'm old. So I can I can remember when SROs first uh, came into our schools um, in, in large numbers, and that was during the COPS program. Right. And if you recall, during the COPS program, uh, if your school district or your school received grants, uh, schools had part of the um, they were part of the hiring process. Both the SRO and the school administrator had to go to the uh, National School Resource Officers Association conference, and we saw a lot of that um, going away when the funding dr dried up. Right. And in some school districts, uh, instead of the um, the SRO being someone who was chosen as the SRO, it was just an assignment that was given. And so we we did see some things that. Um, use of force you brought up uh, in, in schools in the fact that in some schools uh, the school resource officer is no longer um, the school resource officer but he happens to just be an officer in the school and they're two different things and we've seen in many cases uh, both in Ohio and nationally where school resource officers have been questioned or, or asked to enforce school rules which is not their duty they're not that that's not why a school resource officer was exactly. put in the schools right so um right you know so I, I i get that that can be an issue um and and i, I worry about that i i do because um i'm, I'm an sro um i i and, and we were we were taught how to go into schools and be another teacher, another right. uh, person for the student to talk to. Um, we weren't there as a hired gun. I mean, if, if you want a gun in your school, you don't need to, to go to the expense of an SRO. Um, 
So um, I, I got a question here and it says if they cancel SROs and the school's still having teacher in the building teaching the virtual classes, who will be protecting them? And, and that's, a, that's a great question. Do you want to take a shot at that first, Ron? Well, hopefully the districts have locked all their buildings up and, uh, they, you know, there's, a, there's some secure security going on there. Um, but they're right. They're just kind of sitting ducks there without uh, SROs available to them. You know, um, as we talk about the SRO, um, I remember the, the 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 last role. You know, they were an SRO. So they had three goals when we put them in the schools. They were to be a a teacher, a counselor, and then third as a last resort as as a, a police officer. And we know that um, uh, we we know that there are um, a, a school resource officer is not a deterrent to a school shooting. For example, at Columbine, right. if we go to the first right. one, there was a school resource officer on the scene. We've seen now having a school resource officer is a, a much quicker response when something bad happens when you have somebody on the scene. But in reality. What a school resource officer is there for is to prevent. I mean, if, if they have to stop, we've missed some signs along the way that that people needed to be looking for. You know, that this is why um, those of you after um, Parkland, uh, those of you that are in schools, you know, the, the Secret Service re-released a document regarding the um, use of threat assessments in our schools. You know, because that is still the number one way of preventing a targeted act of violence. I really like what you said at the beginning when you said a positive school climate. That's that's definitely number one. And you can tell school climate simply by how people answer the phone. You know, if if you know if you have somebody, a secretary that answers the phone and says Woodruff High School versus good morning, Woodruff High School. How can I help you? That tells a lot about your school climate. The first person they have contact with, folks. I, I'm, I'm reminding you. I just got a. I got a message. There is a um, Q and A icon on the side. Uh, looks like it's maybe the six button down. So if you have questions, please type them in. Um, if you don't have a question, um, but if you want to shout out about, um, talk about. Um, what's the SRO structure in your building right now? Do you have them or do you uh, anticipate having them? Have you had them but left them? Um, I want to talk, there was another question that came out about calling a lockdown. And um, let's talk about that just for a second. First question, and I'm going to throw you a ground ball. Is lockdown a plan or is lockdown an option? Because a lot of schools miss that, mix that up. I would say it's a plan. You need to plan for these things. Uh, I I worry about uh, the option part uh, because uh, you know as well as I do. If you've read the reports, uh, one of the school shootings involved uh, um, fire alarm. Uh, pulled fire alarm and everybody ran out of the building and, and uh, there were shots fired. I, I, I personally, my own opinion is I prefer a lockdown and just stay put until the police come by and tell you it's all clear. Okay. Um, I will agree to disagree with you on that. I, I think That's we fine. need to get our, our staff choices. Um, you know, I, I'm going to go back to the, the fire drill piece because I, I think that is so important, not just for um before the, the the pandemic but you know let's look at what happened when um we we did see that and and you know there were some questions where um you know people say don't exit the building if there's if the fire alarm is pulled and that that is you can't do that okay the 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 thing is just like you teach your kids at home if you believe there's a fire in the house, get out of the house as safely as you can, not as quickly as you can. You know, the quickest way is to jump out the window, but that may not be the safest. So when, when the fire alarm goes off, I can remember back in my days of being a teacher, I would tell the kids to line up at the door. 
I'd tell them to head out the door, go to the left, et cetera. Um, but I was always the last person out. Well, now what happens is when the alarm goes off, we're teaching our teachers to go to the door, feel the door. Does the door feel hot? Open your door, look out in the hallway. Do you see a threat? Make eye contact with the other teachers. And then you can decide, we don't see a threat. Let's start going. But the teachers, like I said, I was always at the back of the line. Teachers should now be at the front of the line because if you have to turn your students around, you as the teacher turn around, and now you can stop your students versus calling them back. So yeah. now in, 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 in 2020 with the pandemic, we're using that same kind of how do we get out of the building safely, not quickly, because we still want to have that six feet of physical distancing. So now our fire drills are much slower. It takes us longer to get out, but at the same time, we're being safer. So yeah, let's my, my comment ahead. was addressed after a lockdown was called. Then the fire fire alarm is pulled. So it related to stay locked down, don't go out in that situation. Right. I mean, obviously, if you have an actual fire and you know there's a fire, you want to get out. Okay, so I've got a question here. Um, mm -hmm. They're talking about rural Wyoming. They focus on Alice and updating and adapting uh, that our school and our fire drills. We allow them to wait and evaluate and they are sensing before they evacuate. And, and Jacob, that is phenomenal because now what you're doing is, and I'm going to be honest with you, um, if you go back to the pre-Columbine days, we told teachers, here's the one thing that you are allowed to do. And, and we didn't give them any choices. And, you know, I, I keep saying this over and over again. We trust our teachers under normal circumstances every single day to make good decisions. We need to train and empower them to make good decisions then. Should you evacuate? Boy, I, you know, when we, when we do exercises with schools, we give them scenarios and they have to tell us why they decided to stay, why they decided to leave, and to be able to articulate that. And so you can't say to someone, you can't leave, or you can't say to someone, you have to stay. Tell us why you're making that decision. The only time we're ever going to say anything is if you make no decision, if you panic, if you're fear. We, we have to make sure that people make a decision. Um, Let's see, I've got another one from Anthony. They have 21 schools mm. in Tennessee. There are the uh, dep there are sheriff deputies in every school and each high school has three deputies. That is phenomenal. That is also expensive. And, and, and you know, yeah. um, we, we had a um, one of our school districts that we work with, they have a high school, two middle schools and five elementaries. And so after Parkland, the city agreed to allow the um the, to hire another police officer so that now there could be a police officer in the high school and one in both middle schools because before the middle school uh sro would drive back and forth so they put them in full time so then some of the parents said well we want to we want a, a, a police officer in every elementary school the relationship between this city and the school district is they pay 50 50 and the school board said we will pay 50% for those other five officers to be in our elementary school. And the city said, but we can't afford it. And so instead what they did is they hired one more officer and that one officer, his, her only duty is to be the school resource officer for the elementary schools. And, and kind of like when you were talking earlier about systematically unsystematic, that officer is at every elementary school every day, multiple times, but you never know when they're going to be there. And so that's how they afforded it. Um, let's see. Um, I've got another one here. Even with the pandemic, what is important is getting sick from COVID or getting out of the school safe during a fire, hiding in a, in a closely in a safe place. Um, Anthony, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and, and, and really the issue with the answer is that in the state of Ohio, I'm from Ohio, um, uh, they did a, a phenomenal job of giving schools information on how to do things safely. In the state of Ohio, um, in, unless you're a brand new building, you have to have you know one fire drill within the first 10 days of class, um, school starts, and then one every month. And then you're, you have to have during tornado season, you have to have your tornado drills. 
You have to have one lockdown drill by January or by December 4th of every year. And what they did is they came out with guidelines of how to do this safely. For example, in Ohio right now, um, if, if, if this were tornado season and our tornado season doesn't start until March, um, we're not going to have the entire school do a tornado drill at once. We're going to say these rooms and we're going to show the kids. Now, if there was a true tornado, you know, that, that's always a question you have to ask. What is the greater threat? So if you had a, a, a true tornado, the tornado was, you know, you, you got the tornado warning. A tornado has been sighted in our area. I'm going to take all of my students and I'm going to pack them as tightly as I can in the tornado safe area because the greater threat at that moment in time is not COVID, it's a tornado. However, if it's a drill, I'm more concerned about my kids getting COVID. So let's spread them out so that they have the ability to stay safe. Does that make sense? Uh, let's see, I'm making sure I'm going to answer all the questions. Um, yeah, it's, I, I, get, I, get, I have a comment right here that says all these actions require staff to take the drills off the paper and train the students and, and staff in the expectations. And, you know, um, boy, I wish this was an opportunity where people could raise their hands because of the question I would ask is, um how many of you are given enough time for training and um we're, we never give schools enough time for training there's you know unfortunately schools are safe and because schools are safe then um we tend to focus on what we really should be focusing on and that is our test scores but that doesn't mean that we can't um continue to focus on safety so um it has to be um, training and, and now with COVID-19, I think we can do a better job of having teachers instead of uh, constantly talking about safety, instead, um, let's have them talk about why we do the drills and how we can be safe, et cetera. Um, almost impossible to do under a hybrid learning. No way you can do it during a, um, a, an online learning, but we have to do our best. So um, I've got another comment here from Jacob. I think the most schools having a mask mandate, the drills are done in under 15 minutes, so COVID risk is minimized. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, you know, uh, gosh, I attended so many great webinars over the summer. If you Google Johnson Controls, um, they did some great webinars on airflow in buildings. Um, uh, Berkeley, California did some great ones. And, you know, we are finding that there is a different spread um, indoors versus outdoors. So, so if I had students spaced out six feet apart outside during a fire drill versus have them spread out six feet inside, there's going to be less spread outside because of negative airflow. So, you know, wearing our mask is going to be important when the kids come back inside to wash their hands. There's all those things that they're going to have to do. So. Uh, other questions uh, that you might have, you can type in. I've got a look here. Um, oh, here, here is a question that came up. How are SROs evaluated? How should we be evaluating our SROs? <laughs> uh, well, the administrator should be aware of uh, what the SRO is doing and how effective he is, and then the administrator should be sharing that with their superintendent and their uh, the supervisor of the SRO, whoever that may be, whether it's the chief or the duty sergeant or whoever. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask those of you that are SROs or have SROs, um, have you gone to the uh, U.S. Department of Education? They put out some really good rubrics okay. for selecting and evaluating SROs. Um, if you remember, there was a there was a horrible incident that happened. Uh, I don't I don't even remember how long ago. It's, it's been some time where a student was misbehaving in a classroom and wouldn't listen to the teacher. And then uh, the teacher called the principal. The principal came down. The student wasn't obeying the principal. So then the um, principal contacted the SRO. And, and unfortunately, the event was videotaped. But the SRO grabbed the girl, flipped over the desk, took her out. And um, 
that was an unfortunate incident. It truly was. But what it allowed us to do was to step back and say, okay, what did that officer do well? What would we do in future situations? But but out of that incident, and, and I know, I, I remember that it, it had to have been at least eight years ago because um, the Department of Justice and the U.S. Department of Education, they put out a really good rubric on how to hire SROs, how to evaluate SROs so that there could be a standard. And, and so when you're writing your MOU between the school and the law enforcement agency, it is very important that you have spelled out how will the officer be evaluated for their effectiveness. Um, and, and that's not, you know, effectiveness is not catching kids who are parking in the school parking lot without their, their um, parking permit. It's not catching, it's, you know, I, I will admit um, probably one of the best SRO programs that I've ever seen, uh, Dublin City Schools, Dublin, Ohio Police Department. Those SROs in that program are never in their office. They are they are never doing lunch duty, but they are in the cafeteria sometimes. They spend almost 100% of their time in classrooms, whether it's teaching in the government class, teaching in the writing class, teaching. They are in the classroom meeting teachers as their students as a teacher and as a counselor. And that is exactly the way it's supposed to be. They're, they're not a gun in the school. They are what SROs are supposed to be. And I've got something here. Uh, the problem with SRO value by administrator is a big problem because administrators ding the SRO when the SRO states um, they don't perform uh, student discipline actions. Uh, the administration that, that holds it against the SRO and usually most SROs lean towards the, the administrator. That is, that is exactly why there has to be an MOU in the following of the state guidelines because, or the federal guidelines, because if you read the federal guidelines, SROs are never supposed to be involved in student discipline. Now, if a criminal act occurs, that can happen, but your MOU, and, and um, you'll, you'll get my information later on during the day, um, uh, or later on during the conference, I can send you sample MOUs that are used um, uh, that, that meet national standards, as well as the rubric that is used um, by the, the U.S. Department of Education, because I'm telling you what, if I was an SRO, because I, I know this happened, it happened when I was a um, I was a safety director for the district because the sheriff's office contacted me. A teacher told a student to remove his hat and the student refused to. And so the teacher called the SRO over and said, I told that kid to take off his hat. He wouldn't do it. Now you have to do something. And that SRO does not need to be enforcing school rules. What would that teacher do if that SRO wasn't there? They'd call the principal and let the principal. Wearing a hat is a school rule, not a law. So I hope that answered your question, uh, Floyd, but uh, I feel your pain. I know exactly where you are in your MOU. So again, um, you'll, you'll have my contact information and you'll be able to, um, you'll be able to, I, I can email you all that stuff. That's, that's, uh, or, or uh, Joyce, I know you're listening. Uh, I can put that in a shared folder and they can all have access to that. So other questions. And I'm not seeing any. Um, let me check here to make sure I didn't miss any. Uh, I have one here uh, during normal school operations pre-COVID. We had an SRO and two SSOs at every high school. We also have an SSO at every middle school. We have four middle uh, mobile SSOs. So they are assigned to four sectors and they work closely with law enforcement to assist the elementary school in case of an emergency. Our SROs have a, a, an on-duty supervisor that also responds. And, you know, what I'm, what I'm hoping um, uh, that is that um, 
to me, it sounds like there's a great relationship between the school and the law enforcement agency, which is huge. You know, um, I'm going to presume that most of you saw have that purple book that the highly effective guide to creating school safety plans. And they talk over and over again, schools, you cannot do it alone. You can't have law enforcement and fire dictate what you do. You can't do it alone. And so it sounds to me like you have the, the best of both where you have the SSOs, the SROs, supervisors, everyone involved. So congratulations on that. Um, any other things, things that have popped up, Ron, in your mind that you want to talk about before we let these people go? We've got about five minutes left. Well, the the training modules uh, that Randy and I developed for the state of Washington were developed because uh, most SSOs are hired without any background in how to handle things. And the reason the state put in a training academy was to give those people uh, tools to use. Unfortunately, when the funding ran out, so did the training academy. And it's too bad it wasn't a model for other states because then it would be uh, kind of continuous training for uh, SSOs. So uh, my manual uh, addresses that issue. Um, so if any of your uh, listeners are interested, they can go to prepared-schools.com and take a look at the training material and uh, maybe uh, download some of that so they can uh, use it to train their school security officers. Okay, well, folks, we are not gonna hold you any longer. I hope to see everyone back again. Uh, Dr. Tim Murphy is going to be talking. Um, I wanna thank Ron for being here today. We appreciate that and uh, enjoy your lunch and we'll talk to all of you later on this afternoon. Have a great day. Thank you.